Hello, and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our third of five talks about fidelity. You'll recall we're working with the ICANN acronym, which stands for interest, compassion, appreciation, and nurture. These being four qualities that help us relate better with one another and from a mindful biology standpoint with our human bodies. In the second session of this series, we looked at the quality of interest, bringing curious, gentle attention to bear on the human body, in particular on the upper airways and the nasal passages. We felt the qualities of breath moving through these airways and use them as a focus for mindfulness meditation. Today, we'll move forward to the quality of compassion. And for this, we'll follow the airways further down into the chest and into the lungs themselves. And we'll also look at the lungs from a few different standpoints. We know, of course, that the lungs enable us to draw oxygen into the body and release carbon dioxide from it. With every breath cycle, atmospheric air enters the chest and the lungs and is released after a brief time within. We can use this animation to look at the lungs from various perspectives. Here we see the right and left lung from the front. The right lung is divided into three lobes and the left into two. The two lungs are approximately the same size and they have various indentations that accommodate organs such as the heart in the center and the liver below. We can move these around, see the back view, the front again, then the three lobes on the right, and the two lobes on the left, and again looking from the front. We looked in the last session at the larynx, where the vocal folds are kept by the body. Those are the musical vibrating structures that enable speech. Below the larynx, the air continues down into the chest through the trachea or windpipe, which itself divides to enter the right and left lungs as two main bronchi. The bronchi further divide within the lungs creating a branching structure rather like an inverted tree. Here we see a more realistic representation of that tree, and you can see how dense the branching becomes and how it progresses from rather thick limbs, the main bronchi, down to very slender twigs at the tips. We can use the pathway of air through the nasal passages down the throat, through the windpipe and into the upper chest and lungs as a focus for compassionate meditation. You can add to your daily practice or even take a moment now to feel the airflow down that pathway and see if you can detect subtle sensations reaching all the way into the upper chest and then follow them back out again. For now, though, we'll move on and look a little bit more at how the airways terminate. So at their very finest branches, they connect with little clusters of air sacs, also called alveoli. These fill the entire lungs with millions, actually, of tiny little bubbles that contain air. If we blow them up, we can see that the little bubbles or alveoli are surrounded by a dense network of capillaries or blood vessels. So the arrangement is one where there's atmospheric air on the inside of the air sac and a 
very rich blood supply on the outside. The membrane separating the air from the blood is quite thin, and so oxygen can easily penetrate into the blood and carbon dioxide can easily escape into the atmosphere. Thus oxygen is drawn in to the bloodstream and carbon dioxide is released. The purpose of the movement of air that we call breathing is to keep the supply way down deep in the alveoli refreshed. So there's always ample oxygen and so the carbon dioxide doesn't build up excessively. Here's a simple animation that makes the same point. We can see the red oxygen molecules moving out of the atmospheric air within the alveoli. They attach to red blood cells moving through the capillaries. At the same time, carbon dioxide, shown here as black, leaves the blood where it is dissolved in solution. It enters the air sacs and is released with the exhale air re-entering the atmosphere. The branching pattern, as we saw, is quite profuse, and it connects the airways with what amount to bubbles that contain atmospheric air and are surrounded by blood vessels. Here we see some very large bubbles, but of course in the lungs, these bubbles are very, very small, actually tinier than a grain of salt in many cases. So there are millions of these little teeny bubbles within each lung. The question arises then, how come we need so many? And the answer has to do with the surface area available for gas exchange. To see how this works, consider a box one foot on each side. The surface area of this box is six square feet, since there are six faces, each of one foot square. If we divide all the faces as shown, we now have eight smaller boxes that fit in the same volume, but have twice as much surface area. And if we repeat that process, we now have 64 much smaller boxes and a four time increase in surface area from where we started. So the idea is that every time we implement one of these division processes, we get a doubling of surface area. So there's a very steep rise in the amount of surface area as the little air sacs are made smaller and smaller. The end result is that within our human bodies, we contain a surface area approximately the same size as this solar array shown on the roof of a house relative to the human silhouette in the foreground. And so because of the very small size of the alveoli, we contain this very large surface area in our ordinary human bodies. One way to imagine this is that we have large wings that of course are folded up inside rather than presented outside to the world but we can get a sense of this delicate membrane that we present to the atmosphere by watching this butterfly open and close its wings. And so here we are moving through the world as it were with these large delicate wings presenting to the atmosphere, collecting gases from it and releasing carbon dioxide into it. As noted, this membrane, this large surface area, is surrounded on, in every instance by a very rich blood supply. So here we see the intimate relationship between the lungs and the major blood vessels and the heart, emphasizing the point that there is a huge amount of blood flow going through the lungs at the same time that it has that large surface. Well, that large surface leaves us a little bit vulnerable because it's delicate and because, in fact, it is very big. And so any sort of pollution or particulate matter in the atmosphere has the potential to come in and damage that large, delicate membrane that separates atmospheric air from our bloodstream and is only a couple of cells thick. 
So people that work in occupations that have particulate matter or contaminated air of some sort are at high risk of lung disease, such as this coal miner seen here. So the likelihood of emphysema and other lung diseases is increased in people who work in such environments. Well, the vulnerability goes beyond the effect on this one man's body. Because if he has a young child, like this little girl shown here, and he develops an illness, it will dramatically affect her upbringing and her sense of security in the world. Not to mention, of course, she may also inhale some of the contaminants that he brings home. And so the vulnerability of our lungs not only causes medical conditions, but it can also weigh in on the side of our emotions and lead to a kind of heaviness of experience. This effect has been recognized by Chinese physicians for many centuries. Here we see a diagram from their tradition, centuries old. So of course it doesn't have the sophistication of our modern anatomical images, but it shows their conception of the lungs in the chest cavity. Now they were certainly aware that the lungs bring air in and release it, and they probably understood that pollutants could damage the lungs. But they also recognize that the lungs are uniquely vulnerable to emotions such as sorrow and grief. I had a personal experience of this when I was little. My parents divorced when I was around three or four, and shortly afterward, I developed a severe pneumonia and was hospitalized for a couple of weeks. So to me, it's pretty easy to believe that sorrow can uniquely damage the lungs. In any event, I think all of us have the experience of feeling emotions in our chest area. We often call this heartache or heartbreak, but we might just as well call it lung ache because the anatomical region affected is the same for heart and lungs, the chest area. Another reason to consider the lungs as a special site for sorrow is to think of the crying of a fussy or unhappy infant. The power of the lungs is on display here in the loud protestation. that the lungs indicate distress, that their movement reveals states of discomfort is well known. Here we're looking at a cow. If you look closely at her flank, you can see that she's breathing fairly rapidly. In this case, she's probably doing so because of a medical or veterinary condition, but she could just as easily be breathing rapidly because of some fear or distress. Those of us who are sensitive to the distress of others and of animals will feel a natural temptation to want to offer some form of comfort, perhaps by wrapping our arms around the creature to provide some sense of safety and support. This is a natural mammalian response to distress in those we care about. We see it most obviously when a mother holds her infant. The sense of comfort and safety is almost palpable in this image. And we each of us have a sense of how it feels to be lovingly and supportively held. And we also know how to offer that same kind of holding to our companions. So as we feel in our own chest cavity the effects of sadness and grief that accumulate there over the course of a lifetime with all of our losses and pains and setbacks, we can begin to develop ways of soothing and comforting the wounded mammal that is our human body, the hurting organism. We can offer support by consciously and explicitly reminding ourselves that this is in fact a sensitive, responsive being, a warm-blooded creature that needs and benefits from support. And in meditation, we can use a visualization, perhaps imagining the lungs as little 
kittens or puppies that are frightened and holding them in our mind with a loving embrace, offering them the compassion of a wise elder. Here we'll move on and remind ourselves that, of course, many other organisms on Earth exchange gases with the atmosphere. In fact, the vast majority of them do. Here's a polar bear shown very schematically, but of course it has lungs and a bloodstream just like us. But even organisms different from us, like a shark, exchanges gases, in this case through gills, underwater. And we could go on showing insects and many other animals, all of them having a means of exchanging gases with the atmosphere. Even plants participate in such exchange. So if we take this leaf and magnify it greatly and go even further with the magnification, we see that it has on its undersurface these little openings that allow the atmospheric air to enter deep within the substance of the leaf. And as we zoom in to the leaf's interior, we see the plant cells exposed to the air that flows around them through that tiny opening. And thus these individual cells can absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen, which of course is the opposite of what our bodies do, because our bodies take in oxygen and then release carbon dioxide as a waste product. But we all understand, I believe, that when plants photosynthesize, they use our waste product, carbon dioxide, as a base ingredient to generate sugars with the power of sunlight. And then they release excess oxygen back into the atmosphere as a kind of waste gas, which of course is very useful to us. Because so many organisms on Earth exchange gases with the atmosphere, we are in an intimate relationship with all of the living beings on this planet, whether they are other humans, as shown in this image, or even something as different from us as a plant, as shown here. There's this intimacy, this near approach through the intermediary of the atmosphere. Well, anytime there's intimacy, there is the benefit of closeness, but there's also the risk. We're very aware of this now with the COVID epidemic because we know that we can acquire infections by virtue of the fact that we're breathing out of the same atmosphere. And so we've taken on behavior patterns to help protect us in the face of the intimacy and the hazards that it poses. So although intimacy is necessary and valuable, it also brings us into a kind of vulnerable situation. Here we're looking at the shift of vegetative patterns in the course of a year, so that the northern hemisphere becomes more green with more foliage in what we call the summer months, say of June, July, and August, whereas the southern hemisphere accumulates more foliage during their summer, which of course are the opposite months from ours. As breathing mammals, we participate in, in a certain but important way in this planetary cycling. And we are therefore in intimate connection with the biosphere. Well, the vulnerability that I mentioned comes in when we look at the changes in the bio biosphere that have an effect on our civilization and on our individual lives. So we are aware now that the planet is warming under the influence of greenhouse gases and that this planetary warming is having major impacts on the world's climate. And we are seeing evidence of it, uh, particularly uh, in California in the form of very dry weather and massive wildfires. So we are vulnerable to the effects of the atmosphere in part because of our intimate connection with it. And remembering that the lungs, according to Chinese physicians, are repositories of grief and sorrow, we can also think of the effect of other planetary and civilization level phenomena, such as gun violence. 
So we've been aware in uh, recent years and decades of the increasing rate of violent death by uh, gunfire in the United States. And this happens in other countries too, although in a very uneven distribution. And as we watch these phenomena in the world, it is natural to feel grief and sorrow, which will tend, at least according to Chinese medicine, to affect and be felt in the lungs. So added to the individual disappointments and bereavements and setbacks that cause grief and accumulate in our lungs, at least according to Chinese physicians, we can also remember all of the global phenomena that similarly cause grief and sorrow, such as the two that I named, but there are many others. And so we gradually accumulate a fairly substantial burden of difficult experiences and sad results. It's therefore healthy and important to cultivate the skill of holding all this sorrow with wisdom and compassion in order that we can remain actively engaged in our lives and do what we can to aid the world as it grapples with its difficulties. One way we can begin to hold all of this difficulty in the world is to feel into our bodies and notice the vast space they contain within. As a sort of metaphor, we can think of how the body contains this big surface area. So here the human silhouette is shown relative to the size of a cube that would have the same surface area as the human's lungs. And so in a certain sense, we contain a vast space within that we can actually feel in a certain sense in meditation. So we've come to the end of this third of five sessions about fidelity. We've looked at compassion using the lungs as a means for getting a handle of, on how compassion can be brought to support this dear human body and the emotional burdens that it bears. I encourage you to work with these ideas and techniques in order to heal and soothe your own mammalian body and help your system regulate and generate the energy and zest needed to meet the world with compassion and love.